is the fourth and final kind of webinar that we've done over the last four or five months, kind of one each month um, since I think October. And you know, each conversation has been focused on a different core dimension of the meta impact framework. So the first one focused on the four types of impact, and the second one focused on the 10 types of capital. The third one has focused that we did in December, focused on the three types of data and combined together, you know, what we refer to as integral data, which is the first, second, and third person um, metrics and approaches. And then tonight's conversation is on the fourth um, major component of the model, and that is um, the four bottom lines. So four types of bottom lines. And, you know, so we'll be diving into that and exploring it. And, you know, we started the series because we're having our uh, new version of our online course begin at the end of February. And so we wanted to use the series to kind of build momentum and energy and, um, you know, kind of create some visibility around the course and get people thinking about these ideas on which we'll be going into more detail in the course. Right now we have, I think, around 25 people signed up for the course, so it's a really good group. Um, I imagine we're probably going to get another five or so, you know, between now and when the course starts in a month. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And, and then um, I think we mentioned in the last call that we've had a new partnership emerge with Kevin Jones, co-founder of SoCap, and a group of people he's working with in the San Francisco area, um, Gather Lab, and um, a few other organizations that are partnered there. And the more conversations we have with Kevin and the rest of the team, the more exciting the engagement becomes. And you know, we're still kind of fine tuning and finalizing some of the aspects. Um, Claudia is you know, just now coming back from a couple hour meeting with one of the key people there, Regina, and, and she will sh share with us a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but you know, one of the exciting things is that the, it's an event in May and I put a link in the chat room um, of a recent blog that was posted um, that I wrote um, with feedback from Claudia, um, kind of l linking the Meta Impact Framework to that event. And you know, I think this is really relevant to the triple bottom line because you know, the, the social impact space is really about a triple bottom line and we're trying to take that to the next level and expand that into a quadruple bottom line. Um, you know, so, and you know, so take a look at that, take a look at the event. It's in the you know, last week of February, of May, rather. And one of the ideas that we're exploring with them is um, passing out um, a free you know, copy of the wisdom deck to each participant when they arrive. So they have the card deck with them during the event. And then having everyone get 100 tokens, 10 for each type of capital, um, color-coded by the capital, and then use that during the event to basically, you know, kind of, you know, give it to speakers, you know, so like if you like a speaker, then you can, you know, give them, you know, some of the tokens related to the type of capital that you felt that they are focused on or generating. So anyways, kind of exploring how we can incorporate that element into the event. Um, I see that Dorata has joined us. Can you hear us? Hi there. Sorry. Hey. Hi, I can hear you. Yeah, great. Well, welcome. Um, so I'm just kind of giving a, a bit of an update on some of the exciting things happening in the, in the Meta Impact space, and then we'll be diving into the conversation for the night. Um, anything you want to share with us by way of how things are going for you? We had a bit of a check-in um, earlier from folks and would love to include your voice in that. Well, thank you. Well, uh, I just got back to Vintar. Yeah, yesterday. I know. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm looking forward to meeting up with you in Scotland soon. And everything is going swimmingly. I'm like super busy since I hit home. Um, but really glad to be able to connect with you on this webinar. Yeah, great. It's good to see you. And I'm excited to follow up with you and explore some of our adventures that we're trying to cook up. Um, so I just reposted the link because it sounds like because I had posted it earlier, some people didn't have access to it. So hopefully everyone can get that there now. Um, and, you know, so, and then also, you know, our event in Australia is coming together. Um, we've just done a bunch of work to kind of get the infrastructure, you know, for registration and all of that in place. Um, and yeah, so, so a lot happening, you know, um, working with Terry O'Fallon, working with Marilyn Hamilton, um, have a new partnership with 
consulting impact firm in Montreal. Um, they're meeting with a couple of different clients this week and next week and have showed them the Meta Impact Framework and have gotten really positive responses. So I'm consulting with them on how to kind of incorporate that into their proposal. Montreal cities accepted the proposal that was presented to them that includes the Meta Impact Framework as the architecture for you know, this innovation um, process that they're leading you know, like 40 different companies through over the next year. So a lot of you know, good things are happening and Claudia and I just keep trying to find the time to like write it all up and you know, kind of present it so that more people can kind of know what's going on. Um, so there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Um, Claudia, do you want to share a little bit about you know, your conversation with Regina and your sense of the event in May? And sure, um, and I want to keep it brief. Uh, and this might be really a good uh, lead into uh, the conversation for today. Yeah. So as Sean mentioned already, so we're really circling around the redefining uh, the social impact um, space, uh, the philanthropy of engagement. We're really investors and everybody's looking at like how can we really be more impactful and uh, what are the means how we can really change um maybe even move already uh into um uh triple bottom line or possibly beyond and the framework that we are uh, working with uh, why that is not the only tool uh, is very helpful to really see um, see more of the full picture and helping engagement, um, social impact engagement on the ground to really expand their portfolio. And uh, so the conference that we are planning, just Sean already talked a little bit about this, is uh, going to be um, uh, in follow up of the whole social cap and regenerative um, agriculture and movement. And uh, I think a very exciting a piece to just follow and track what's going on there. And uh, so with that, I think I'm just uh, want to open the space for our today's uh, conversation. Yes. Great. Thanks, Claudia. All right. So we're going to jump into triple and quadruple bottom line. I'm going to do a screen share so I can make a few points by looking at the model. Um, all right, so here we have, this is just on the Meta Integral website, you know, so you can go there and, um, you know, so here's the, the Meta Impact Framework. And you can see that the four, you know, here you have the four impacts, um, you know, then you have the 10 capitals, and then you have the three data, and then around the edges you have the four bottom lines. So the people bottom line is these five um, capitals. The profit bottom line is these five capitals. The planet bottom line is these five capitals and the, the bottom half. And then the purpose bottom line are these five capitals on the left hand side. Now, part of what's you know, exciting about this approach to the bottom lines, I believe, is that it really turns the current approach to bottom lines on its head. And, and I think addresses some of the challenges and limitations of current approaches to the triple bottom line. You know, so obviously the triple bottom line was a huge step forward from a single bottom line, uh, you know, going from just planet to focusing on people and planet. Um, and, and that really emerged, you know, um, you know, over the last, you know, 30, 40 years. One of the challenges that I, th I think um, occurs in that space is to, to make the bottom lines play in Claudia, I'm gonna mute you. Sorry. All right, okay, much better. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so basically, you know, the idea was to include, you know, people, social realities, and the planet, natural, you know, um, environmental realities. Um, but a lot of the way that's ended up being operationalized included has essentially been a third person systemic approach. So, so profit, planet, and people all end up being, you know, basically, you know, third person systems um, metrics um, that in the integral model we would associate primarily with the lower right, right? And that ends up leaving out all these other realities. Um, and even though they're including an expanded viewpoint 
the reductive tendencies of modern capitalism kind of reaches its fingers into that effort and kind of slowly, you know, pulls it back towards the playing field that is the dominant playing field, which is, you know, exterior, inner objective, you know, third person metrics, um, which, you know, they're obviously powerful and important and, and a crucial part of the picture, but they end up reducing and gutting, you know, the intersubjective cultural, social aspects, um, the, the first person psychological, emotional, you know, and even spiritual dimensions, right? And, and even, you know, sometimes the behavioral of, of the individual actors that, that get subsumed in a more systemic orientation. Um, so part of what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to re-expand the triple bottom line, and then we also add the fourth bottom line, re-expand it to actually be in alignment with what we feel was the original intention of the triple bottom line. And that is when you talk about people, you're talking about their interiors and their behaviors, right? You're talking about their experiences and what they're doing, right? When you're talking about the planet, you're talking about the you know, social and environmental systems, but you're also talking about um, the cultures and, you know, the, you know, the ethics and, you know, the um, social, you know, realities that are more intersubjective and relational. Um, and then, um, in addition to those three, when you use the, the integral model, you see that, well, people includes kind of the top half, you know, profit includes the right hand half, and planet includes, you know, the bottom half. Well, then you say, well, what about, you know, including, you know, the left-hand side, all the interiors, the individual and collective interiors. Um, and what's interesting, if you look at the various efforts to expand from a triple bottom line to a quadruple bottom line, and there's a lot out there, 90% of them, when they have a fourth bottom line, they bring purpose in, right? And one of the reasons why I think they do this is because the current three bottom lines, people, planet, and profit, are primarily operationalized, as I was saying, in terms of a third-person um, systemic approach. And so the, the inclusion of purpose is kind of a, a counterpoint, trying to bring in the interiors, trying to bring in meaning, trying to kind of bring in the, the qualities that have kind of gotten extracted and reduced out of the current approaches to triple bottom line. So then it's like you have kind of three systemic bottom lines and then one kind of interior bottom line. You know, and, and so that, you know, sets up a dynamic where then the purpose bottom line is having to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to everything that deals with kind of meaning, individual interiority, collective, you know, um, shared vision, um, you know, community dynamics and coherence and so forth. Um, and, and so when you look back at, at the meta impact framework, you see like, oh, well, actually purpose naturally would include the five capitals associated with the left-hand side would include the spiritual, psychological, and knowledge, and the social and cultural capitals. And so you get this really nice symmetry of having the four bottom lines, including five different um, you know, types of capital. One of the integrative design features of this setup um, is that if you see health and human capital, right, the two red ones um, that are part of clear impact, those two forms of capital appear both in the people bottom line and in the profit bottom line. And, and so similarly, you know, each of the different major types of impact and their associated forms of capital occur in two bottom lines. And so this creates a weaving so that we, we move away from having these isolated buckets where certain capitals are only found in you know, the profit bottom line on certain capitals are only found in the planet bottom line. And rather you have this overlapping and this kind of double dipping, if you will. Um, and, and what that does is it helps highlight the, the interrelated nature of the bottom lines, right? And, and so when we measure the bottom lines, you know, we measure them by looking at, you know, the, the specific metrics in each capital. Um, and so, so there's not confusion um, in terms of how we're measuring the bottom line and what goes into it. So it doesn't, in that sense, it doesn't matter that we're double dipping because we can clearly see, you know, what we've used to measure health and, you know, health capital and human capital. And even though we're including it in the ledger, in a sense, in, in both types of bottom lines, um, 
you know, it helps us get a fuller picture of like, if we're talking about people, like we really need to include both their actions and their feelings and experiences, right? Like to just do one or the others seems a bit absurd, right? And so, so there's a way in which this design helps us move away from the kind of current, I think, challenges with triple bottom line and addresses them because we always can include just the third person aspects of all bottom lines, right? So we still can talk about the four bottom lines strictly in a third person objective fashion by focusing on this outer ring. But then that sets us up to then also include the second person, you know, participatory dialogical methods and the first person, you know, subjective experiential methods. Um, you know, so for those diehards who are not yet ready to talk about a quadruple bottom line, um, you know, we still can present it in strictly third person metrics, but those third person metrics are not just the systemic metrics, right? So they're the third person behavioral metrics, they're the third person, you know, um, experiential metrics, you know, or psychological metrics, um, and the third person social cultural metrics. Right, so this kind of allows us to satisfy, you know, the mainstream in a sense, but it, it also creates these on ramps where it's a lot easier for us to then move towards a more holistic, a more integrative approach to the bottom lines. Um, and so, if you go up the page of the website, you can see, you know, here's the the five connected to people, and here's the five connected to profit. And right, so the two red ones appear in both. And then down here, you see that the three um, yellow ones from high impact occur in profit and planet. And then likewise, the two blue ones from, you know, wide impact occur in planet and purpose. And so part of this, too, is also to help foster integrative thinking. So we get out of the tendency of trying to put everything in their box and keep it all separate. Um, but rather start to recognize the, the dynamic interrelationships um, and, and part of what's great about profit here is we expand profit from the strictly financial viewpoint. And profit refers to five types of capital, all of which are the exterior capitals. And, and this is actually in resonance with how we often talk about and think about profit. Um, you know, because we often think about profit in terms of human capital and skills and the workforce, manufactured capital in terms of what we owe and the assets. Um, natural capital has often kind of been translated into, um, you know, different financial metrics, right? Um, and, you know, and even health, a lot of the approaches to health capital, you know, are kind of connected to, to money in one way or another. So there's a way, again, where the way we define profit can align with how profits often just talked about, but it kind of expands it, but it expands it in a way that, you know, a lot of people who are in the mainstream context you know, who but are open can kind of say, okay, I see what you're doing, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't rub them wrong, the wrong way too much, right? Even though they'll kind of be a little like, oh, what are you doing? You know, like what's going on here? Um, so, so all of this is, you know, trying to use language um, to interface with what's currently happening, but do it in a way that helps move things to a, a conversation and a, and a way of thinking integratively that can allow new kinds of conversations to happen. Um, so let me pause there um, and, and actually move out of the, sh the screen share because I think that is sufficient to kind of give you a visual sense of you know, what we're doing. And I see Pierre, you've joined us, so welcome. Um, hey there, you wanna say hello? Um, everyone's introduced themselves a little bit. Um, it'd be great to have you say a few words. Uh, yeah, okay. Hi, Sean. Uh, hi, Runa. Hi, Harry. Um, I'm just joining, actually. I missed uh, a lot of those uh, sessions before. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, but uh, we've been uh, working with Sean on several other meetings uh, offline uh, with projects we have here in uh, Laval, uh, in the Montreal area of uh, Canada, in the Quebec province. And, uh, well, where uh, what brought me to the meta impact model is with um, Hani Koli uh, mm. of Humanio, who we were also uh, asked often by companies or especially institutions, how do you measure impact? Uh, you know, for any 
collective projects, especially there's lots of cooperative type projects for innovation. Uh, and no one has the answer <laughs> properly uh, other than yeah. financially. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, when we found here with the meta model uh, something uh, actually that joins my values from a long time mm. as a philosopher. Mm. Uh, yeah. Nice. Wonderful. So yeah. That's a short so intro from from myself. Thanks, Sean. Great. Yeah. And before you go on mute, you know, I was sharing with them a little bit about the work that I'm doing with you at um, Human Yo and in Montreal. Um, and that you guys have a client meeting tomorrow. Um, do you want to just say a little bit about how you're exploring to use the Meta Impact framework in the context and the conversation you have tomorrow with um, the Laval um, Cultural um, Project? Uh, yes, it's a, uh, well, first of all, the project itself uh, is uh, a, a kind of a little consortium of uh, art and culture in the city of Laval, which is a kind of suburbia in Montreal. So it's a kind of flat land, uh, you know, not integrated, no downtown center, really more shopping centers. Uh, but th there, there is a, a lot of people. It's the third city in uh, Quebec province in size. And uh, the, they, they already worked for since 2006 to 15 on uh, getting a diagnostic of the state of art and culture and they realize they're pretty much at the beginning of an history uh, uh, of an evolution of something new of uh, merging of resources um, and not just dependent dependent on uh, government funding right. uh, so they decided to get together there's 50 uh, stakeholders involved uh, and uh, there's been a, a small organization uh, created to, to guide and pilot that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have uh, established initially uh, what we call in French on des enjeux, like uh, issues, big issues that are important. What's interesting is they have uh, the four main thematic of issues actually fit the four mm -hmm. quadrants. Oh, wow. Impact types, like yeah. almost perfectly. Wow. So already, you know, you see it. Then when people get together to get a global reflection, uh, that there, this is what's in the discussion. There's a coherence yeah. here. I'm really happy to see that because mm. it the foundation of what they're doing, which is after the issues, is what are impact do we want for the future? They're right. using a, mo a model they call the uh, model of um, well, it's about where you project in the future. The, mm. the impact you want, and then you work backwards to now what you yeah. need to do. Uh, and uh, and we're going to accompany them to uh, with, with that. This is, they, they did not know how to do the macro management mm. you know, because they're not the artists themselves uh, who want to help create the synthesis of all this, the synergy. But how do you bring synergy? without being like a government who just throws money right. uh, or you know, uh, rules. Uh, you, you, you need to do something that will weave all that and that will educate also the, the stakeholders in the process. So that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, it's exciting to kind of get a, a fresh report from, from the field on how some of these ideas are um, engaging out there. So thank you. Um, so you know, having just kind of walked through the, the four bottom lines and kind of shared some of the, you know, kind of meta architecture behind it, I'm curious, you know, what comments, questions, insights, confusions, ahas have emerged for anyone around, um, you know, kind of seeing that and, and getting a sense of how our approach to the quadruple bottom line is in some ways importantly distinct from a lot of the approaches to triple bottom lines out there or even other quadruple bottom lines out there. Um, so any thoughts or comments or questions from anyone? And Holly, given your background, I'm gonna call on you at some point just to give you a heads up. Um, Eric, any thoughts you wanna share? Oops, yeah, there we are. Yeah, I was starting to form a question as you were presenting, and then you sort of answered it towards the end of that. Okay. Maybe <laughs> underscore, you know, in terms yeah. of a direction that I was thinking. So, uh, let me let me frame that in terms of um, 
working purpose into it because some yeah. of us we have naturally more interior quadrant orientation so yeah. even taking quadrant orientation as a typology i would say right. you know my own thing is uh you know to be focused on the left hand side more and the you yeah. know the, meaning, the inner subjective and all that and i was wondering how to weave that in so i really appreciate the way when you draw that like the half circle and that it's mm. encompassing both sides the the exteriors and the interiors and that that is a way of opening a, a conversation for people who might not orient mm -hmm. the same way that I would right. where to me it's just natural to include purpose but for others it was like well, why would that be there and mm -hmm. I think that's a very clever way of you know structuring it so that it opens up that dialogue for people who might not otherwise um, you know be inclined to include that so that was yeah. that was kind of the aha for me that's mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the key takeaways. Great. Yeah. And I think often what I see when people include purpose, different approaches include purpose as a bottom line, they not surprisingly kind of define it in a very narrow way, kind of like an individual sense of purpose, right? Or maybe a shared vision, like kind of an organizational mission statement or kind of like, what are we doing this on behalf of? Like, what's the bigger point, you know, how do we connect with the, the larger planetary dynamics that, you know, are meaningful as a, you know, you know purpose-driven or mission-driven organization. Um, but then it often, like, beyond that, it's like they're not really sure what to do with it. <laughs> you know? So I think part of what I like about the, the framework is that, you know, it highlights that purpose, you know, is comprised of, of spiritual capital and connecting to ultimate meaning and something bigger than yourself. Is connected to psychological capital, so a sense of you know emotional well-being and optimism and you know um, resilience to challenge. You know, um, it includes knowledge capital, so like you know having the knowledge you need to like understand you know your situation and the world and your job, and you know that that feeds into purpose. Um, you know, and then social relationships and connections with others, and then cultural context and background. You know, are also part of purpose. Right. And in some projects, maybe purpose as connected to any one of those five capitals might be more important. So, in other words, some projects might have spiritual capital and psychological capital as kind of highlighted as the sources for purpose. Um, you know, in other projects, you know, more community based projects, the purpose might be found more in the social and cultural aspects of capital in that context. Right. So all this is to say by having kind of five flavors of purpose, right? It gives more dynamic flexibility for how you can then find purpose and measure purpose in a project, right? And kind of expand it. And since purpose really is about meaning, both individual and collective meaning, then it also to me makes sense that some of the capitals would focus on the individual meaning making process. And some of the capitals would focus more on the collective or social meaning making um, process and that we want both right and we want to include and measure and make visible both um, the individual and the collective expressions of purpose um, because like if you have you know a company purpose that's really clear and so you're focused on the social and cultural purpose and measuring that and saying oh yeah like there's you know there's a we're clear on our purpose people are aligned with the purpose right but if then you have low psychological capital and people are stressed out and they're overworked and they're, you know, there's kind of a shame based culture, right. Or a competitive culture that's kind of toxic. Right. And so the, you're very low on the social capital or rather the psychological capital. Then in a way it's like that individual can't connect into the purpose that's been set up by the collective dynamics and, you know, process. Right. So you, you need to have the psychological capital to be at a certain point for, for that person to then participate in the collective shared meaning making that's been established, right? You know, and so, so there's other kinds of examples that kind of highlight that you really are you know, better off to kind of work on both sides of the street, both the individual forms and the collective forms, but often people will tend to are drawn to one or the other in part for what you're saying around our individual quadrant orientations right and that also can apply to organizations or teams that they'll have a preferred quadrant orientation right and they'll look primarily through you know the collective or the individual lens or the interior or exterior lens um so um so i think the you know it was a really great point that you're making and so what else yeah, yeah. eric and 
Oh, and just to, just a tag on that too yeah. of uh, what's valuable for me is becoming more self-conscious of my own orientations and biases, right. how yeah. to, you know, include more of the other side as I yeah. tend to, you know, be more left. -hand. And I would imagine, as you say, in organizations, especially nonprofits, for instance, right. there might be tendency to be less focused on some of those right-hand uh, quadrant ones yeah. and to, to bring that in. It, it seems like it's a great way of, you know, melding those natural inclinations of, say, mm. for-profits and nonprofits, for instance. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And Holly, if you're available, I saw you, you popped in on video and then you popped out. Um, there you are. are. Do you have any thoughts or responses to the whole idea of triple and quadruple bottom lines and how that has played into some of the work you've done on round? You know? Yeah, <clears throat> there's some uh, reflecting back. So in the 2000s, well, for 25 years, I, I lived in Cleveland and I worked okay. in economic development from a lot of different perspectives. So yep. from manufacturing to the last 10 years, I focused on building a sustainable economy. Oh, wow. I worked with entrepreneurs to major corporations, to faith-based organizations, to government. To, oh, wow. And so I did teach them a little bit about the four quadrants, mm -hmm. and but not, not with all this detail. And I really... Wow was always got stuck with everybody trying to take everything and, and pull it into the profit bottom, bottom line. Right. Like, is, is there a way that we can keep some of that separate? You know, why do you have <laughs> right. to translate everything to dollars? And um, so I'm, I'm grateful for what you've shown because it'll give me some more to talk about. Like here's right. some ways that you can keep it separate and right. it doesn't have to be all down to the profit. But I wanted to share about, I work with faith-based organizations. Yeah and help them create sustainability strategies. And they started talking about sustainability as being care. Right. So they really were going for their interiors. Yeah. And what's great about working with faith-based organizations is that, of course, they educate a, a wide uh, range of folks in the community because yeah. people come every Sunday there and they learn about that. And then they can apply it to their business yeah. where they might be more right-handed but if they had some left-handed that they're getting from their mm. faith-based organizations, it might help them create a more holistic. So I, yeah. I really think working in a community from these different sectors and, and perspectives, and as you were saying, you know, maybe they lean and have their favorite quadrant, right. but if you can make them aware of, yes, you know, here's an engineering firm and they're very right-handed right. and here's some examples of that. And then here's some left-handed organizations that are more design or art oriented mm. or faith-based or spiritual. And so in a community, if you could share that, then perhaps government can get a feel for right. what their role might be to have all four quadrants. Yeah. And uh, so I see, so that's how I'm seeing this as being able to point to specific ideas and examples to share with organizations that might you know, lean towards a specific quadrant and help right. them feel really good about owning that quadrant right. and putting it out there to the rest of the community. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, when you think of the word sustainability, I think for most of it, it has kind of a scientific, you know, exterior feel to it, right? Like it just, there's so many associations over so many years, you know, that that's just kind of how we relate to it. And so even though we think of like care for the earth, you know, like sustainability is a, a way of caring for the earth, we often lose that inner subjective quality of relationality that is, you know, a really important part of sustainability, right? And actually being in relationship to Gaia or, you know, animals or other people or, you know, so, and I think the faith-based approaches is because they have such a strong stewardship model that comes out of their, their faith, that there is more of that relational, cultural, intersubjective, you know, kind of elements and aspects to their approach to sustainability. And I think you're really right. It serves as a reminder to us that, wow, and this is kind of the point in, in the model is that, you know, the, the planet bottom line is both kind of, you know, the, the right hand exterior systems, environmental, you know, scientific stuff, but it's also the relational, cultural, social care, you know, um, you know, intersubjective space too. And, and we really want both of those to be part of sustainability and part of the planet bottom line. Because if we only really define sustainability in terms of kind of the scientific exterior aspect and we leave out the interiors and the meaning and the purpose, then it's like we lose touch with why and how do we do sustainability? 
like it just kind of becomes part of the problem, right? You know, so there's a way in which it's like we have to reconnect with the relational aspect. Um, and so by including the social and cultural capital um, in the, the planet bottom line, um, and that doesn't have to just be social and cultural from an, you know, an, an anthropocentric sense, you know, from a human centered thing. Like, like we can talk about the relational fields, you know, between, you know, species and across species, right? And I devote a whole chapter in, in the book Integral Ecology on this topic. You know, so I think eventually, you know, way down the line, probably, it would be wonderful to, to include metrics that, you know, are able to tap into that aspect of social and cultural capital. So it's not just humans we're talking about, but we're talking about humans and other species or just within other species, right? You know, so I think that's very possible as well. Um, I'll just add, <clears throat> I've done a lot of work in biomimicry, which they okay. try to yeah. really focus on both the reconnect and what you get from reconnecting with nature, which right. is more of an interior thing, as well yeah. as looking at the design and emulating yeah. what nature right. does through design. And so Janine tries to get at all yeah. aspects, but a lot, a lot of times the reconnect, the interiors get dropped. Yeah. She doesn't drop it. Right. Yeah. And when she presents... She's got it. And that's yeah. why people want to listen to her because right. she's got it. But then how does that get, yeah. get out into the community? And so, and then I'll just say that, you know, what really creates change is love mm. right? yeah. and beauty. And um, that's what inspires us to, to yeah. change is love and beauty. And so if those are more interior yeah. aspects, if we can highlight them more, the love yeah. of place or the love of yeah. family, we'll yeah. do almost anything for the love right. of family or love of a place. Mm, so yeah. I think bringing more of the interiors and the love word into, into the mix is a good thing too. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Like I, I think we need to reintegrate love into all of this, right? And I think like that's the point. That's why we're doing this, right? And it's like we, we need to find and be courageous of like how to bring, you know, love and, and talk about it and include it kind of in these spaces because it's so crucial. And yet somehow we've gotten afraid of like, oh, no, no, like we don't mention love, right? Like in, not in a business, in a boardroom, right? <laughs> but it's like, why not? Like, you know, isn't this why we're doing all this? Um, and I think the point you make around, you know, how Janine uses the word reconnect, how for her that really has the, the left hand, you know, relational piece. But then because she's up against, you know, a very strong cultural dynamic, you know, the scientific paradigm, the sustainability paradigm, it's like we don't have the expressive capacity to, to stay in relationship to the semantics, meaning that she's imbibing into that word. And so it quickly kind of gets translated over into, you know, more you know, sustainable exterior types of ways of relating to that. And I think that comments very, you know, you know, that dynamics very common in, in other situations as well. Um, so thank you for that example. Um, great. Anyone else? Um, Claudia, anything you want to add, you know, given your integral business background and kind of dynamics or trends you see in this space? Here, well, this is all really... Yeah, go ahead. We can hear you. Yeah, so this is all uh, really juicy and... Um... So just to really anchor us a little bit in the in the greater movement, because um, one of the questions uh, for this week is also like, how do we really bring this out? And um, so w there have been, of course, a movement of bringing uh, the triple and quadruple button lines into organizations. And I think uh, what uh, uh, both Eric and Holly are pointed to was already like, how do we really do this? And um, part of uh, what I'm, what I think we all kind of seeing coming up is really how do we create more of an embodied sense um, yeah. and knowing um, to really create. And I think language is really forming a new here. Uh, I know some people using the word regenerative and also the whole reinventing, reimagining. You know, all these kind of be trying to reconnect to something um, and. So that there's this wisdom of a system, there's a wisdom of an organization, there's a wisdom of a society, and if we're honoring um, each of those different um, uh, currencies and values and capitals, they all play their role. Um, and it's in the split that we're kind of uh, disconnecting ourselves from the greater purpose of of, of what we're all yearning for. And 
to bring this into organizations and we really probably still you know this is a new territory he even the lalu described uh, very thoroughly in his perspective what field organizations would probably mean i think we're really touching on new movements in organizations um and uh, we all together need to define how we're getting in there. Um, one part that occurs to me in my uh, work, uh, I feel more and more drawn to, uh, and see also colleagues, big colleagues doing this, bringing more um, the knowledge of uh, wisdom societies, of um, rituals, um, really uh, even so write out passages uh, into back into organizations. And not in a Google sense, but we need to anchor things into like a, a deeper awareness. And uh, it's work that we all need to do together. So there's no one way really to do that. Um, but the framework provides at least a way in. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, seeing that, you know, as the word sustainability has gone mainstream over the last 10 years, that in a way it's, it's lost its cachet. And so now we're looking for the new word, right? You know, regenerative thrive, thrivability and so forth. It's like, um, you know, so, so it's, it'll be interesting to see how those new terms, to what extent do they get co-opted by the tendency in these discourses to reduce the word to, a primarily exterior third person objective kind of mode right um, because often those words are, are a reaction the new words are a reaction to how the previous word is kind of you know gotten reduced to a smaller meaning than what it originally was intended um, you know and so the, so the, the new words are trying to rehabilitate and include some of the dimensions that have been left out um, in the process um, but then you know the 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 tendency is for the, the culture to kind of pull it back in some way. So, um, and I think the other thing that for me stands out about our model with the triple bottom lines is, you know, often when I hear people talk about triple bottom lines, unless you get into really detailed kind of accounting, um, you know, in, in ways that I think are useful, but kind of miss the point that it's like, there's not a lot of understanding of like, how do you measure the bottom lines? Like what goes into the bottom lines? Whereas this model provides a clear roadmap, right? Like here's the five capitals that are part of this bottom line. And, and here are the three types of metrics, you know, first, second, third person metrics associated with each of those capitals. So you can just easily look and see what are you measuring? What capital does it go in? What is it a first, second or third person um, approach? And you just can kind of see like, oh, well, we have primarily third person, you know, metrics across most of the capitals in this bottom line. We have a few second person metrics um, and a few first person. Um, most of our metrics are in these two or three capitals and we have hardly anything in this capital, but all of this is part of, you know, that bottom line, right? You know, like it gives you a real clear sense of like, okay, what are we measuring and how does it line up and feed into what we can and can't say about the bottom line, you know, the person bottom line or people bottom line, right? So there's kind of a transparency that I think becomes possible. You know, um, I just haven't seen a lot of good examples of, oh, we're doing th triple bottom line and, you know, this is what it looks like and this is what we're measuring, right? It's like, it it's often seems a bit abstract and it, or it gets lost in the statistics, right? Because everything's getting funneled into, you know, the, you know, kind of lower right systems, you know, style of, of metrics. Um, and, and Pierre, I'm curious, you know, in the work that you do in the context of impact, does the triple bottom line framework um, come up much? You know, do you work with that in your organization or is it more a focus on impact and it's less connected to the notion of a bottom line? I tried to unmute you, but you'll have to unmute yourself. Pierre, I was inviting you. Are you able to speak to that? Can you, there you go. Actually, uh, no, it's a question I have. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. Um, so, so, so with many of the clients you work with, are they wanting a triple bottom line approach or are they kind of struggling to figure out what that even means? Uh, I think that's it. We're, we're struggling. 
yeah, yeah. what it means. Uh, and and there's also in measuring impact, uh, you know, to me anyway, I'm too new to the uh, the examples. I need I need to see more examples where, for instance, uh, capitals other than financial right you know, uh, actually have a value that you can even trade right it's a way of speaking because yeah. they're not all, they don't have the same dynamic some are internal right. yeah i'm right. not saying that you trade the internal yeah perspectives but it's uh that's it you know or they, they have their space and yeah. and um because it, the idea of capital is also that you can accumulate the capital a bit like right. a chart yeah uh, with energy of something um for the at least maybe the external one so to me uh, i'm more stuck at that level mm. of the question yeah of yeah, the measuring and, change yeah yeah and in the course we'll we'll dive into this more because yeah it's like most of the definitions of the capitals talk about a stock right mm. which comes from kind of the financial and natural you know it's like you have a stock of timber, you have a, a stock of this resource, a stock of this equipment, right? It's like, it's kind of like, it's, it's a way of saying, how big is your pile, right? How, how big is your pile of wood or your pile of water or your pile of machinery or your pile of money, right? So there is this way in which the way we think about these things is in terms of a stock or how much of it do you have and, and can you trade it? And if you trade it, you know, what, what's the value of trading it? A lot of that thinking can cross over into the interior, you know, um, types of capital, but some of it doesn't. So this is where it's like we have to like be, we have to think anew. We have to be creative. It's like mm -hmm. we have to start to expand our mental models of value and capital and exchange and visibility. And you know, and so it does require this you know, a different kind of integrative thinking. Um, and we've been saddled with a very reductionistic form of thinking. Right. And, and, and we're up against that. And it, we're probably going to be up against it for a while. And so this is where in the modeling that I do, I try and find ways to kind of align with that thinking um, opposed to like going against it head on. Because I find when you do that, then people just shut down. You don't make much progress. You know, like and then they just expect a higher burden of proof from you. Right. You know, it's just like it's, it's kind of a conversation stopper. But it's like the more you can kind of, you know, like in the, the Zen master talks about how you have to align with ego in order to overcome ego, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you have to kind of align with the mainstream dynamics, um, but then expand it a little bit. So you create a little, a little discord, right? A, a, little, a little cognitive dissonance, but not too much, right? You know? um, so I think that's part of our challenge collectively as we work with these ideas and we tr work with clients and projects that are open and interested in these ideas because so often I come across people want this, they're hungry for this. They just want a roadmap on how to do it. Right. You know, and so, so how do we build that roadmap together? How do we, you know, work with these distinctions and these ideas? Yeah. Holly. I wanted to talk about the stockpile thing yeah. really quickly. Yeah. I worked with Michael Kinsley at the Rocky Mountain Institute. Mm, no. And one of the things that he taught me was the idea that capital actually is more valuable if it flows. Right. Because it touches mm. more hands. And the example mm. he used, and maybe this is a simplistic example, but yeah. if you have a warehouse of goods, it's actually they count the number of turns. The more turns yeah. of the warehouse mm. means that you're you're um, you're making more money. Right. So if you think about capital turning versus stockpiles. Right. And right. how do you put that in a metric um, right. and, and uh, in a community, in a business, whatever. So flowing is actually healthier mm. than stagnation. Yeah. Again, yeah. So how do you get the idea of flowing um, into this conversation? Great. I love that. And I think it's interesting because like, if you look at social capital, one of the ways we measure social capital is like how many connections do you have? Right. Which is kind of like a, the stockpile <laughs> version. Whereas like if we looked at how many new connections or, or, or connections you've revisited and re-engaged, right? So if you looked at the flow across the network, opposed to how many nodes are in your network, right? You know, those, you know, so there's kind of like the static counting of how many nodes in someone's network they have um, versus, you know, the flow across the network, which is to your point, I think, you know, and it's true, the, the value is in the flow, right? Um, and same with like psychological capital, we can talk about 
resilience and optimism? Like kind of what's your reservoir of optimism? Like how optimistic are you able to be in the face of challenging circumstances? Right. Kind of like what's your stockpile of optimism? If it's just a little bit and after a few challenges, you're kind of deflated and collapse and get reactive, then you don't have a big stockpile of, you know, optimism. Right. So, so there are ways to kind of translate some of these ideas into the other capitals, but we have to be careful about the reductive potentiality of that. And I think your point, Holly, is a really good one that we want the dynamism of the flow as well as, you know, the, the stockpile. And you, you find, see, I, I, uh, I work with a philosophy school where we yeah. uh, basically teach, train in the long term, you know, mm. a whole yeah. program of, uh, ethics, you know, sociopolitics and yeah. uh, learning to live with history and all that. And so it's a global uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, and the, just like you said, that optimism, you know, that yeah. Uh, yeah. idealism, yeah. it needs, you need to know how to resource, regenerate yeah. yourself constantly. Yeah. It, yeah. It cannot be just a stockpile of it or right. a good book you read and that's enough. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no, exactly. It was totally, totally. Um, so we're at the top of the hour, so I want to wrap up. Um, but I wanted to check in with Runa if you had anything you wanted to add and Dorota if you wanted to, to jump in here before we close out. Oh, uh, so I'm unmuting. Okay. Okay, yeah, here, here I am. Uh, yeah, I just, I just want to say that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited about this, uh, Sean, and uh, I, I'm doing your masterclass training, mm. so I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, and then to, to look for opportunities to bring this in. I, I, I was dipping a little toe in by giving a, a talk to a bank in Iceland last year on their request. It was about the triple bottom line. Yeah. But I added and beyond, mm, yeah. and I introduced mm -hmm. this. <laughs> yeah, great. Good so for you. I, yeah, so I was talking to them, not as an expert on triple bottom line, but more showing them the trends. Yeah. What I saw was emerging mm. without any one thing being the right, right. thing or being the it. But, yeah. but I, I, I felt so, because I had been at your training in, in Iceland that one little right. day. And so I, I felt um, excited to, to share this with them. Yeah. Because it, it is, I think it, it's like we, when we talk about how can we all collectively bring this out. Mm, and yeah. it's, it's going to be a, a long-term project. But if each, each one of us is, is looking for opportunities in, in what we are doing and where we are and where we, we might want to go, yeah. um, I find it very exciting and grounding to have this framework. Mm, wonderful. So thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Hey there. Yeah, I was just going to say I find it all very inspiring and very interesting. I was thinking about the idea of flows. You know, we have these local exchange trading systems, let systems all over the place, and nobody has any money, but they have lots and lots mm. of transactions. And right. every single transaction creates a social relationship yeah. and builds social capital and builds resilience. And yeah. it's all really easily mappable digitally yeah. to all the transactions. Yeah. So I love all of that. And also, you know, the notion of flow. I mean, that's why money is called currency. It's actually supposed right. to be current. It was never, yeah. ever intended to be <laughs> sitting in an account right. somewhere. Yeah. That's making everybody poor. So I was working today with uh, Good Governance Institute. Um, they haven't actually mapped things the way that you're mapping them. So I was quite excited. Yeah. Mm. Excited to be able to sort of share that knowledge. And then I met up with Marilyn Hamilton about two weeks ago. And she showed oh, yeah. me your wisdom economy cards, which oh, I, I absolutely love them. And I really yeah. want to buy a set, blah, mm. blah. Yeah. And also, um, she showed me the cards that she had about the she, which oh, she yeah. probably mentioned to you. And I got the book today yeah. in Finthorn, so I'm yeah. just about to read it. Yeah. So I'm looking at all those capitals, the spiritual mm. capitals, the, all of the ones that you met. And I thought, isn't this really cool? Because we're rebuilding the Center for Positive right. Change at Newport. Mm. So I was in there today, covered in dust, because we're uh -huh. literally deconstructing the building and rebuilding it. Wow. It's not a metaphor, it's a real thing. And so that Center for Positive Change is really going to be a good place for me to start working with this. Mm. Um, we're having our Board of Trustees meeting next week, and I'll be introducing all these concepts to them. So I'm drinking it all in. Yeah, great. It all, 
and, uh, right. and hope to see you in Edinburgh soon as well. Yeah. And you have to come to Finthorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're excited to get up there. Um, yeah. And I, I'm glad you mentioned currency because, you know, we often break that down into current and then see, like can see visually. So you can see the current, you can see the flow, right? And this is the one of the main points of the Med Impact Framework is how do we make visible the flows in all these capitals? And to your point is that a lot of communities, you know, informally are already engaged in exchanging value across these capitals. So we actually already have systems that are dynamically working across these different, you know, kind of categories and, and exchanging. And so part of what we're wanting to do is since it's already happening, we're wanting to make it visible, right? And yeah. visible in a way that doesn't reduce it to, you know, a financial variable, but makes it visible on its own terms. And this is where, you know, our collaboration with um, Holo and Holochain and, and the blockchain community and looking at how can we actually create software that's value accounting based that provides a way of, of making this visible so you can, you know, track it in a better way because it's already happening. Right. And so, yeah. so it is very exciting. Um, yeah. And, well, you know, the, it's, the famous phrase, if it ain't fun, it ain't sustainable. If, the, right. if you've got fun ways of making it visible, yeah, it's even right. better. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, good, yeah, cool, thanks. Great. I want to myself. So, Sean, are you actively working with Holochain? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a number of connections. We have a MOU in place, a memorandum of understanding. Um, they're in the process of providing some funding for us to work on a project with them to start building um, the software in um, Holochain. Um, and, you know, cause they have a lot of partners in their system that want this ability to track these capitals um, as part of their own, you know, collective, um, you know, process. So, yeah. so yeah, so it's a longer term project, you know, probably be, you know, yeah. one to three years, but, but yeah. yeah, we're starting in on it. So, so I'm, I'm excited because Holochain is my favorite crypto. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, one, of, one of my biggest holdings in, in my little portfolio. Yeah. So, yeah, and I'm, <laughs> I'm doing that just on intuition and, right. you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's like a lottery. It's, it's investing right. <laughs> in something that might have a future, yeah. might not. But I've, I just find it exciting what they are trying mm -hmm. to do and how they are trying to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. great. All right, Claudia, is there anything you want to say as the final word, and then I will close us out? Um, no, this is all very uh, amazingly beautiful, and I'm excited to be uh, in a uh, follow-up conversation with all of you. Um, those who are joining the call right now uh, remotely after the recording, um, please feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, and we are um, looking forward maybe here and there to meet one of you in person, maybe joining us for the master class or in some of the upcoming events. Great. Wonderful. Thanks, Claudia. And thank all of you for joining and for all of those who will be joining through, you know, listening to the video later on. Um, look forward to being on the journey with, with each of you. So thanks for, for being part of this. Have a good evening, yeah. everyone, and a good weekend.